find our salvation in order to be part of the kingdom of God. <clears throat> to be part of the kingdom of God, it's very simple. It's not a hard, it's not a hard or burdensome way in which to be a child of God. You must first have faith. For that faith, you cannot please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You've got to believe. And then Jesus many times said, unless you repent, you shall all likewise perish. And so he wants us to repent of those sins that we have acquired in our body at the time, up to the time that we are having those sins washed away. But then he also says, if you don't believe in the one who died on the cross for you, and you're not ready to voice with your mouth and confess that he's the one that is able to take those sins away, that he's the one that can give you life in the hereafter. If you can't do that, then if you were to die, and you were to do all the other things, but you didn't confess me. He says that when you appear before him in glory, that if you weren't able to confess him, he says neither will he confess you before his Father who is in heaven. So we must confess that he is King of kings, Lord of lords, that he is our, our Lamb of God, that he is the one that was slain, and that was predicted to be from the foundation of the earth to come and to save us and take us away area that the devil wanted to keep us keep us in death and then he says in order for me to do those things that I told you about in order for me to be able to take away those sins to remove those from you I need for you to briefly go into the watery graves of baptism where I'm going to perform a function that you can't see but he says I'm telling you I'm there to do it and I'm going to change that body that going down in that water, I'm going to take away all those sins that you've acquired in your life, and I'm going to remove them from you. And I'm going to remove them from you, I'm going to do an operation on you, I'm going to take away those sins, and then when you come up out of that water, all of those sins that you've acquired in that body, it doesn't matter whether your friends or your neighbors that knows those sins that you did, they don't, don't worry about them, and they don't want to forgive you for things that you've done, that's their problem. He says, I'm the Lord God, I'm Jesus Christ, I'm the one that I say that they've been removed, they've been removed. And don't let people put them back on you. And then he says, I'm going to lift you up. And he said, because you've come up and you've gone through the death, burial, and resurrection that basically I went through, you're going to be able to come up and you're going to be able to have a new life that you can walk in. He said, no longer will you have to go in and have that baptism done over and over and over every time you have sins. And all you've got to do is remember now that you've identified who I am that there's an advocate with the Father, and that's me, Lord Jesus. You pray to me. You ask me to forgive you of those sins, and I'm right and just to forgive you of those sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And he says, if you go walk now, you go walk and you talk about me, you tell people about me, you go out there and you be an ambassador for me, you, you be the child of God that you now are, you go out and you try to get more people to do exactly what you did because you knew it was the right thing to do. And so if there's anybody here tonight that wants to be a child of God, I hope that when you're seeing an invitation from him that you will not let this night go by, that you will not do what you know, I believe, you need to do to be a child of God. Walk the walk. Go out and be a boy to the Lord this week if you possibly can. Let people know how important this Christ is to you and how he saved you from death. As we continue to look at Revelation, we're looking in the 18th chapter now. And as we're in the 18th chapter, we're looking at the destruction of 
basically of Babylon, and we're looking at the fall of Babylon, and when the apostles revealed Jesus Christ, and we know that he did as Lord and Christ, as King of Kings, as Lord of all lords, as head of the church, and he is, the temple of God, and we know that the mystery of God was fulfilled according to Revelation <coughs> the 10th chapter. Now we have talked about the seven plagues and we know that the seven plagues had to basically be fulfilled before any of this could take place. In fact, we know that the pouring out of the seven plagues, here's what it did now, we've learned this already, destroyed the great city, the whore and the beast, her government and the old nation of Israel and it was brought to an end at the cross of Christ. And her plagues came in one hour of one day. Now we've looked at that. We've talked about that. The day that they crucified Jesus Christ, our Lord, is the day that God departed from those people. Now I want you to think about what he did on the day that he died on the cross the day that they killed him. Did you notice the rent the temple of the Old Testament? It rent it from the top to the bottom. He plagued them to death at the cross. Now we're talking about a spiritual plague. They don't physically die or physically done in physically as far as their old Jewish ways are concerned until the destruction of Jerusalem. And physically, spiritually, they are dead. And everyone is spiritually dead until they accept who? Jesus Christ. Now, do the Jews, even today, do they spiritually, have they accepted Jesus Christ? No. Now, there are some that say that they do, and they call themselves Jews for Christ. And there may be some that have made the transition to get out of Judaism and become Christians. That's great and wonderful. But for the most part of the old Jewish nation, they died spiritually. They never would repent. They never would go the other way. And so they, they died spiritually by God at the cross, because he, he was done with them. He was tired of what he'd had to put up all these years, and when they finally killed his son, that was the last, as you say, straw that God could stand. So spiritually, Israel and her government and the beast that we talked about, which was written by the whore that we talked about the last two or three chapters, who was the great city, was dead. And for this reason, in 17 and 18, for this reason, she is called the beast of the bottomless pit. Now, what did she do, old Jerusalem do, basically, that we've learned so far that we've talked about? Well, she refused and chose death and destruction. She chose death and destruction, and she chose that she must be cursed and that she must rot with the damnation of her sins. Well, what was she? Well, she was a whore, an unfaithful city, an evil government, and she had committed fornication with the kings of the earth. And I'm going to list several things on the screen up here for you to look at about, about how she was and how that her choosing death and destruction was brought upon her. Number one, the bringing in of the new priesthood meant the destruction of the old. I can't get the new priesthood in until I destroy the old priesthood, according to Hebrews 7 and verse 12. The next one is the bringing in of a new kingdom or a new nation meant the destruction of the old kingdom or the old nation. Number three, it says the bringing in of a law of faith which was the gospel of Jesus Christ, what did have to happen? 
To do that, you had to have the end of the law of works or the law of Moses. You can't keep practicing the law of Moses and then start adding all this new stuff to that. One had to be done away with before the other could be brought in. Number four, the bringing in of a new covenant meant the end of the old covenant. Now you notice I'm putting these scriptures up here for you to write down or see what these scriptures are where I'm getting this instead of filling all these slides up with a whole bunch of scriptures. That's where you can look to see that what I'm telling you is based upon evidence here. Number five, bringing in all nations as one in Christ meant the breaking down of the middle wall petition. I can't keep the middle wall petition, still keep the old covenant, co uh, covenant and then bring in another covenant and put them both together, can I? I can't do that. He couldn't do that. So you had to basically bring in all the nations. They had to be all one in Christ. They had to break down the middle wall petition that separated us from all those laws and those ordinances that were contrary to us. And then number six, it also says that the sacrifice of Christ upon the cross meant the end of all blood sacrifices unto God. Could you bring in the second covenant and keep doing animal sacrifices? What good would that have done you? So there had to bring an end to the old to be able to bring in the new. And we no longer have to have blood sacrifices because Hebrews 10, 11 through 14 tells us that there is one and only and there won't have to be any more and it was Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. And then we have number seven. We have here the building of a new temple meant the destruction of the old temple. Now let me ask you, has their old temple been destroyed? Can they find it? They're not there today, is it? I mean, when he took it away, he took it away. They can't even find a place to build it. They can't even make it, make it again because they can't put it where they think it used to be. Do you think that things are the way they are, that they're not able to build it again because they can't build it on that particular part of the land because a lot of that land belongs to the... Who could make a plan for God so that would never happen again, that temple could never be built at the location it originally was than God Almighty and his plan? Oh, they could go build it. They could find some more land in the city of Jerusalem and they could go build it somewhere, but it wouldn't be the same because it's not going to be on the exact spot that God told them to build it to start with. So in order to get rid of the old temple, to make new for the new temple, what did he have to do to the old one? He had to get rid of it. Two plus two is four. If he had to get rid of the old covenant to bring in the new covenant, he had to get rid of the old temple to bring in the new temple. That's just common sense, natural fact. Therefore, what was glory to one, and that is to one group of people, became basically a funeral to the other. Now they're left, don't have anything but they're still wanting to practice their old Judaism ways and think that they're able to please God by doing it. But what did he do to them at the cross? He completely separated himself from them. In fact, the lamentation in chapter 18 over the destruction of this ungodly city, it talks about the whore who is Babylon or the city of Jerusalem with her people and being plagued with seven plagues. Now the seven plagues in chapter 18 poured out nothing but lamentations. What were those lamentations in 18? It says destruction and the death of old Jerusalem. So the old law, or the old, had to be taken away before the new could actually be established. Therefore, the pouring out of those plagues in chapter 15 was glory and a reason for angels in heaven and men on earth to rejoice. Therefore, I hope that you can see that the old city with her old covenant 
it had to be destroyed before there could be the glory of the new one. So we have the fall of Babylon, and that takes place in 18. Now Babylon, if you remember now, those of you who've been following me here, we first announced Babylon's fall. It was announced in chapter 14. First time it comes up is chapter 14. We announced about the fall of Babylon. However, it came with another announcement. I hope you remember what that announcement was. When the fall of Babylon came, guess what the announcement was? The announcement was the talking about the preaching of the everlasting gospel. What had to fall before the gospel came? Uh, you putting this together now? The gospel did not come until basically there was a covenant that was destroyed and a people that no longer God wanted to, to keep practicing the way that they had practiced concerning worship and their beliefs and their old laws and things that had, had kept not only them down, but had kept other people down. And so basically it had to be the sending out of the everlasting gospel to be preached to all the nations of the world. And then the next part of the verse that we're going to look here in Revelation 18 and 20 is there was this great light. Now we've sung the song, Sam, Send the Light. I probably can, in your mind right now, can you get the tune going? There's the, I mean, come on, now you, you've got it, you, you can do it in your mind right now. You're doing the chorus already, probably many of you. Send the light, you know, the blessing. That's sending the light, that's the everlasting gospel. That's that gospel being sent out. So if you would, let us look here at 18, 1 through 2, it says, And after these things I, things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon, the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Now you see where it says the habitation of devils? Was there a basically a church? When we finally get through with this part of Revelation and we start doing the churches of the seven nations, was there some church that was a seating place for Satan? Hmm. Was there some evidence that Satan had his own seat and things were going on? Let's tune into that. That's going to be coming up. The angel is the descent of Christ upon the earth to take upon himself the nature of the servant and the likeness of man. And that's in Philippians 2, 7 through 8. The work of his personal ministry, you remember Jesus' personal ministry, the, con the consummation of his work in his death and his burial and his resurrection from the dead. And the earth was lightened the earth was lightened with his presence. Was the earth lightened when Christ first came down from heaven and came to this earth? Was this world lightened by his presence while he was on earth? I don't think there's any of you that would say that it wasn't because what do we know? In him was life and the life was the light of men and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. And the word was made flesh, Jesus came in the flesh, dwelt among us, we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus said, as long as he was in the world, what was he? He was the light of the world. However, we must also remember then that the coming of Christ brought on the fall of the old covenant of old Jerusalem. And that's in Galatians 3 and 16. 
his coming also lightened the earth with his glory. What was he? He was the way. He was the truth. He was the light. Now, those of you that have been following me, the angel in chapter 8 with the golden censer, do you know who that was? That was Christ. The angel in chapter 9 that had the key to the bottomless pit, do you know who that was? That was Christ. The two witnesses in chapter 11 is Christ, the witness of man and the witness of God. The child in chapter 12 that was called up to God in his throne, who was that? That was Christ. And then the Lamb in chapter 14 with 144,000 that were redeemed saints. Who was it that took them? Christ. And when we get over to chapter 19, we go to chapter 19, riding the white horse. Guess who's riding that white horse? Christ. How do you know it's Christ? Because the passage says, with his vesture dipped in blood and the sword of the Spirit in his hand. Everywhere you go through here, it talks about Christ, 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 Christ. Now, is there any reason to deny that this is not the revelation of Jesus Christ? Well, let's just do another one. You go over to chapter 20. Who has the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand? Christ. And so you can see that Christ, he lightened the whole earth with his glory. In the story of Christ, and basically with all that we've looked at here, his work and the redemption of the world, he came to remove the first covenant so that he could establish the second. That's part of why he came. He came to get rid of that first covenant so that he could give us the second covenant. Because I can't live under the first covenant. How can I live under the first covenant and have my sins gone? What did he have to bring? Christ brought the avenue for the second covenant that was able to take away the sins of the world by the one and only lamb being dead and sacrificing his life for you and for me. He removed the ministration of death and created the administration of life and immortality. And how does it say life and immortality came? Through the gospel. How do you get life and immortality? You get it through the gospel. <coughs> 2 Timothy 1 and 10. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have been made new. Revelation 21 and 5. And let's not forget now, it talks here about the <coughs> angel descended and lightened the earth in this verse here. Babylon fell, didn't it? Who was Babylon? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. It was at his first descent that the earth was lightened with life and immortality, according to 2 Timothy. It was at his first descent that he took away the first covenant and established the second, according to Hebrews, the 10th chapter. All of these events came in his generation on earth came on his generation. Matthew, 20, Matthew 16. Therefore, in chapter 18, in verses 1 through 3, it says here that it has reference to the first coming of Christ, his victory over death, the establishment of the new covenant, and the removing of the old covenant. When Christ established the new covenant, he established the church. He established the light. He established the gospel. He established the new order of worship. And he established the work under the Holy Spirit. Now you think of how all these things he was able to accomplish for him being able to come in the flesh on earth. He took away the old and look what he gave us in the second. He made avenues for people that there were no avenues before. He provided himself as the king of kings and lord of lords. He provided himself uh, so much to the point that God himself said, All power and all authority has been given to who? Jesus Christ. 
Why? Because he earned it. He earned it because of what he did. He earned it by taking away the old. He earned it by bringing in the new. He earned it by giving us life and immortality through the gospel. He gave it by the day of Pentecost. He gave us by giving us the Holy Spirit. He came by giving us baptism. He came by providing a way to have our sins washed away and for us to be able to be absent from the body and be present with the Lord. Let me tell you something. I praise him every day for what he did. 